Uh, we move on now to um, items relating to patient insight, mm -hmm. uh, which I invite Tim Kelsey to introduce. Just before I do, I should just record that um, members of the board yesterday participated in a, in a dementia session, uh, I thought very well hosted for us by the Alzheimer's Society, uh, to try to develop within us a sensitivity and, and an understanding of the challenges uh, faced by people suffering from, the, from those diseases that make up uh, dementia, including Alzheimer's disease. And uh, the board, I think, is very keen to get under the skin of a number of these issues that patients face in, in dealing with the NHS, and, and more generally in society with conditions such as, uh, as dementia, which are not visible uh, to often to uh, outside observers. We're also, of course, uh, more generally across the parallel field of mental health, subject to a, an obligation to give parity of esteem to mental health and to try to understand how we can uh, bring the NHS closer to meeting some of the quite exceptional challenges in that area. So for us, patient insight is absolutely critical to what we do. Tim, over to you. Uh, thank you, Chairman. So. Um, as we said in previous meetings, the uh, NHS England is uh, fundamentally and centrally committed to prioritising patients in every decision it makes. And a commitment we made some time ago was to be very transparent in the way we both listen to patients and the broader public and, and, and then demonstrate our response to, to issues that, that, that are raised. Um, so in a sense, uh, we, we, the, the, the point of this uh, initiative to create a web based tool, an app, which will enable us to monitor on a daily, weekly, monthly basis the kind of conversations that are being had about the NHS just amongst people in our communities and more specifically the conversations that are being had about particular services by individual patients as they, as they receive them and, and subsequently um, is a really important resource for, the, for, the, for, for, for NHS England and it's, it's also really important that we're very we're very transparent about the way we interact with that data. So broadly put, I think this is about us beginning a new and um, in, in some part real-time conversation with the communities that we're directly serving. Um, the, the, specifically, before I quickly show you some of the, uh, some of the actual uh, uh, pages from the, from the new tool, um, it's worth just reflecting on the sources for the data. So we're, we're, this is a very new kind of thing for the NHS. We, we haven't got ready-made, real-time sources of data on what people are telling us about, about services. So we've tried to be as creative as we can as we move towards that objective. And you'll see the priority placed on things like uh, whether patients are actively uh, likely to recommend uh, local services to friends and family members. That's a new data source which actually has started coming live in April. You'll see that's already in the tool. But with staff, we're equally interested in understanding whether staff would recommend the services that they, they're working on you know, to their friends and family. And that data at the moment is, for example, annual. Um, we're about to initiate a monthly data collection which will give people a chance uh, not just people who work in NHS England, but much more broadly people who work in the health and care service to tell us whether or not they feel that their service is, 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 is worthy of, of, of their recommendation or not. Um, we've drawn on real-time data sources like the kinds of feedback that um, uh, hundreds of thousands of people are giving to um, NHS Choices, the public information service that we now uh, a commission on behalf of the of the whole system and and other similar data. I think I think people will find interesting the way in which we've worked with partners to try and harvest real insight from social media. So that there's an all, in, you know whole world of commentary that's being given to us on Twitter and on Facebook, which at the moment we're not uh, properly listening to. So just to set it in context and 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 in that context too, I would really like to thank my team, the team who's worked on this, and, and with with colleagues across the board. It's been a phenomenal piece of work that's that's really has taken uh, the midnight oil. But at least we're at the beginning now. And in terms of rollout, um, the idea is that this service, which is currently live, we test now. We need to seek feedback from from the community within the within NHS England and, and beyond um, over the next couple of months, and then it will go fully live to the general public in August, where again we'll be looking for feedback. It's a journey. It won't be perfect at the start, uh, but at least it's a beginning. So if I can quickly just uh, show you what it looks like. Um, so at the moment we've broken it into two parts, and here we have the uh, app-based presentation of it. 
Um, we've called it insights. This is the national level. So you can see there are various kind of lenses through which we are listening to people. The first of those is uh, in the top left, um, you know, would patients recommend services to friends and family? As I mentioned, that data actually is from uh, the Midlands and East where they've been running uh, a pilot uh, on, on, on that for some time now. Um, underneath that, we have an analysis of complaints data. Uh, there's an enormous richness in the complaints data the NHS receives. It's not been well unbundled. Um, so there are some insights we're, we're, we're receiving there about, about different kinds of complaints, about different sorts of services. Top right um, is what's known as a Wordle. Um, this is a, a, a means of visualising what people are telling us from that real-time uh, data that I was mentioning before, the sort of feedback we're getting on NHS choices. So these are the words that are, are being emphasised in, in the <coughs> comments that, that, are, that are being made uh, uh, right at this minute. Um, and, um, and then we have the staff data underneath that. Do staff recommend their hospital services? So th this, this, f this visualisation of the data will change on a daily, weekly and monthly basis, but largely it will be completely refreshed every week. So the idea is to keep it live and interesting so that we do continue to pay attention to it. Um, th there's th the sourcing of the data, an important factor is obviously um, articulated within the tool behind those little information icons. Um, an important point here is uh, related to the staff survey data. At the moment, as I mentioned, we have annual data. We now have arrangements to get that to monthly quickly. I think this will be a very important source of data, not just for us, but for all our colleagues who work in, in, in health and care. Um, then we have a different lens. So this is the, that was really looking at what patients are telling us about services, how they're complaining, and so on. Now, the set, this is a different lens. This is the, the lens of the conversation that's being had about health and care without health and care. So this is just what are people talking about in their daily lives? What are they complaining about? Um, and what issues are they raising? Again, you can see the sort of, at the moment, those words, cold, pain, uh, are coming out strongly from the, from the very broad family of data that's being... Um, uh, analysed. Um, we've broken out a few of the sort of key tweets that are being most highly retweeted um, and obviously that, this changes in real time so this is just a snapshot. We can see underneath that, in fact, I think we have a slide on this, that we have a daily perception. So if I just go back there, on the bottom left we've created a new measure, a new index of public perception of the NHS and that's based on uh, a daily analysis of 18 different topics that are analysed across all social media and aggregated into an index score, which we can then plot on a graph. So that will, you will be able to break that down into the individual kinds of things that are being spoken about. I mean, none of this is definitive nor statistical, but it important, I think it provides us a very important basis for understanding really what is going on um, in the communities we're serving. Um, that's just a, a, an illustration of what I just mentioned. So just in, 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 to finish, <coughs> this is the timetable testing out there with um, the public from August in a sort of beta version, but people will be able to see it, play with it, give us commentary back, and then we go live uh, formally, as it were, uh, in November. And, and that then will, I hope, become an instrument of, of formal board reporting to this public meeting from that point onwards. Thank you, Tim. Can I just, sorry, can I just say, it's quite difficult to see from the back here, Tim, so we can get some copies made for members of the public if they'd like them to take that, Sorry, that, this, is on, this yeah. is on the public website. Oh, okay, fine. And uh, so that this, this presentation is <laughs> available on the public website. Okay. Thank you. Victor? I think this is really, really good, really strong, and in the sense that um, for a while there's been a, a, a lack of, of, quanti of qualitative data that we can use to measure. Um, so, well done. I think this is really, really a good first step. I just want to make sure, though, that we're able to use this information um, in, well, in a, in a number of ways. And one of the ways I'm particularly interested in is, okay, so we've got all this information. Is part of this um, work about telling us um, about the experiences of the people at the sharp end of the inverse care law? Because if we want to drive that um, that that inequalities gap, yeah. we want to get rid of it, yeah. then the experience of, of the people that, um, that are challenged are very important. So I'm just interested in, in, in what your views are on, on how we use this, yeah. this fantastic step forward to actually drive into those communities, those individuals. Yeah. That's, 
Yeah, that's a really okay. That's a, that's an incredibly important question. I mean, I think the board is aware that we've just launched a, a partnership with UK Online to take 100,000 of the most disadvantaged people into basic <coughs> online health literacy. But there's a there is absolutely a question about how we make sure that this this listening this um, is something which is is totally inclusive. Uh, and so we are really listening and understanding. Uh, communities who are not naturally users of the internet or the web or digital tools. Um, I'm rather hoping that the kind of conversation we can now have as we move towards um, the November sort of formal launch with, with you know, organisations like yours and Kieran's and, and the voluntary sector as a whole will help us um, uh, develop the, the sort of information office so we are targeting it much more effectively or more effectively at those communities that we need to listen to hardest. Can I just very quickly, yeah, can, are we just, are we also going to use other methodologies that bring um, views into this um, that don't rely on the use of the internet? Just because I'm aware that there are 8 million people who don't access yeah. this stuff, I, I just want to make... Yeah, well, it's, it's well really, no, and so just to make the point, we this is of course accessed over the web, but really this is about mobile phones. So, so almost all this data is either is either um, reviewable on a mobile phone, hence the iPad app, or it is in fact contributable on a mobile phone. So, uh, so what I mean, if you take, for example, homeless populations, we know that homeless populations are far greater users of mobile telephones than you'd expect. Um, that doesn't mean they pay; they're not pay as you go, but they are receiving uh, information over mobile. That's how people get hold of them. Um, so we need to understand the particular characteristics of different communities that we want to um, we want to listen to and understand how we can take this to them. But but broadly put, uh, there's no there's no <coughs> platform more inclusive than the mobile or the smart the smartphone. So so think of this less as a web tool and more as a, a mobile application. But it's a fa it's a very important point you're raising. Bill, thanks, Jeremy. It's, it's to reinforce Victor's point really. What what one of the commitments we made in the business plan is wherever we can in presenting, collecting and publishing um, data and information, we'll do it with an understanding of different geographical areas but also people with different characteristics so, so, so that we can understand at quite a deep level which parts of this country are getting left out, whether, yeah. whether it's geography, yeah, yeah, yeah. whether it's groups of people. And uh, th th this is a very early stage. I know t t t Tim's team and my team are working quite closely to make sure that we, we can make these data sources as rich as possible so we can do the right thing for people who, who are at risk of getting left out. Thank you. Thanks, Martin. Um, two questions to Tim, really. One, you said contributable. Does that mean people can risk, you know, you're or often, make comments? Or you can, yeah. 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 Okay, <laughs> thank you. Um, that's really helpful because it triggers you to say something, doesn't it, when you learn something. Yeah. But my second one, as you said, this isn't statistical, um, but of course it is It, it is um, numbers, but what people will really be interested in are trends. Yeah. And given the kind of speed of updating information, yeah. how will you capture kind of, you know, trends matter on a yearly basis or on a daily basis, depending on what, what the information is. So um, uh, what I'm thinking about is the information that disappears, where will it go, as it were, so that people can look back to longer yeah. trends? Yeah, well, it, it won't disappear, so we're starting this now. Some of these tools are new, so they don't have a, a, a history to them. Others are, are not new, and we can already track the trends in things like staff surveys and so on. Um, but the idea is absolutely that this will become an ongoing uh, analytic machine, uh, which will offer a number of different sorts of functionalities obviously trend analysis being amongst the most important um, so so that's that's absolutely the the, the plan so uh, you know the, in a sense I've just given you a very quick uh, overview and I even didn't mention which I should have done of course that there's the England level but you will also be able to drill into this at trust hospital trust level two um, so so um, and, and as time goes by we will be able to offer much more longitudinal kind of insights which are the ones that matter yeah. Maggie. Um, two more points really on the sourcing of, of the data. Um, building on, on, on Victor's point really about how do you know you're getting the data from a broad section of people. Yeah. I mean I can see how you get the social media stuff without having to go out anywhere because you can just capture that but how do you select who contributes public opinion? And the second question was really about the staff and patient input because NHS England doesn't operate any services mm -hmm. so the vast majority of staff and all the patient input is 
accessible only through the people who run those services. So do we have some sort of um, hard agreement with the operators of services that say they are going to provide this information yeah. to us on a certain periodicity? Yeah. Is that how it works? That, that is how it works. So right. we, we, we have contractual arrangements through the standard contract for hospitals, for example, to provide the friends and family test on a specified basis. Um, and also we legally have the responsibility of setting the standards for data collection in, in services that we commission. So we have a number of levers that we can use to support and help providers develop these data services. Um, uh, yeah, so we do, we do have those. those, those Ruth. Okay. Right, so a, a Sorry. <coughs> follow on, Tim, from Naguib's. You've addressed the issue of accessing opinion. Is there some way of refining it so that we can also access solutions? Because we've got 60 million people yeah. out there who have a hugely vested yeah. interest in the NHS. Yeah. And that's where the intellectual yeah. capital for solving many of our problems yeah. will lie. I think that's such, such a, a really great point. I mean, so this, in a way, is a sort of breakthrough, but it's kind of sterile as well. It'll tell us something, but it's not getting to the point you're... you're which, and this enormous asset, which is our staff, our citizens, you know, which is, we haven't really properly unlocked yet in terms of reshaping, redesigning the way we approach health and care in, in so many different ways. So I'm, I'm hoping, and there's a, you know, it's an important challenge for all of us, that we can move quickly from merely a, a reporting tool to something that's much more fundamentally about a network of engaged citizens and patients who are absolutely helping us design the future of health and care. That sort of sounds a very lofty objective, but it is absolutely where we should be heading to. Totally. Yeah. Okay. In, in that case, Tim, is there going to be a way of managing expectations? So if you've got uploading of information on a daily basis and changing yeah. um, uh, uh, analyses on a daily basis, there will be um, an expectation that there'll be responses almost as quickly. And um, mm -hmm. you know, to an extent, that puts an enormous amount of pressure um, on, 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 on the, the executive and, and, and everyone else within the organisation. Um, and, and clearly, you know, we will be responding, but obviously need on, on, on even a monthly basis, because that doesn't give the opportunity for proper analysis or qualitative thought to um, uh, actually yeah. um, deal with the, the information. Well, well, just, I mean, very quickly, I, I think there are different moments in the cycle of response. So, I mean, um, you know, Bruce intervened in Leeds uh, a few weeks ago, very, very rapidly because of a very serious issue in relation to potential patient care, which may have emerged, say, from data that's collected here. So there's one response which absolutely people should hold us to account for doing very instantly, and, but then there are other types of response which, of course, will need more thought. So I think that's, that's something that, in a way, the data will help us resolve. But I, I do agree. That I, I, I think people, I mean, uh, this is a very common kind of resource in other in other sectors, I'm sure John Lewis, you know, would have their fingertips all over social media instruments, and and I think that the the, the customer in those contexts is pretty sanguine about the uh, the way in which an organisation needs time to respond. So I think I think in a sense, of, if we can develop a kind of maturity about the conversation we are having with the people and communities we're serving, I, I think they'll respond with equal maturity. But I I do agree that we will be exposing here things which may need very urgent response, and we will have to be just accept that's an additional pressure. Well, thank you very much, Tim. I think there's a, a, a general sense of excitement um, mm -hmm. within the board about this as being a major step through to do something which hasn't been done before. Uh, I think the range of uh, data that can be released and the trends are going to be critically important uh, for the shared journey because it's not simply the board that is dictating the future of the NHS. It's a shared operation and uh, listening to the patient voice <coughs> is going to be a critically important part of it. I would also commend um, the point that Bruce made as the uh, for its future development as a platform for solutions as well as for yeah, uh, diffusion of information. Yeah, I mean, there needs to be, I, I think, a cut-off point in terms of, of the data that can go in there because we don't want to overflow uh, too, too much data. We want to identify high points, high trends, uh, and then invite um, uh, engagement from those who use it. Also, I thought that the point that Victor made about how we, how we reach uh, the audiences that are otherwise other having access to the internet, but um, the issue about mobile telephony uh, is, is also a critically important one. So the adaptability uh, of the dashboard to all modes of um, transmission, I think, is critical. But thank you for that, um, and um, I think the board uh, warmly endorses it. 
Right, may we move to your next paper, Tim, on the patient focus. So since the um, since NHS, NHS England was established as the Commissioning Board Authority, um, there's been a, um, a, a proper focus on how best we can express our, our values and vision, uh, particularly for our own staff. This has been, a, as I think, well, as everyone has said, a, a, a very turbulent uh, transition. And, and one of the things that has been, you know, is very important is that people have a very clear sense of their own, their own mission and how, how they contribute to the, to the core purpose of the, of the health service. So we, over the last few months, have worked with um, around 500 members of our team. So that's getting close to not quite everyone, but a large number of, of, of the team who've, who've given up their time in the midst of all other businesses to focus on this core question for them, which is what, what do they see as the core mission and vision of, the, of NHS England? Now, some people will, get, will, will think, well, surely you already know what your, you know, your core vision is, of the NHS is before we start, but actually this is a very, very important process for us to have gone through with our staff. And what we're presenting here today is just, the, in a way, the beginning of a journey. This is a, an iterative dynamic process in which, as people come and join NHS England, uh, they will all participate in the refinement and development of these, of these core sort of visionary um, uh, visions and values. Um, the, in a sense, what, what the, um, uh, the distillation of all those workshops and discussions um, with, with staff, and, and with many others too, has been to, to come to a single idea from which everything flows. And that idea is that we are here to deliver high quality care for all for now and for future generations. And, and the, the importance of that statement is, is that you know, we are commissioning services in health and care, not just for today, but for tomorrow. And from that very, that very simple but, but very rich statement of, of mission comes you know, a, a whole range of, of um, insights with which we can then shape the way we individually as members of the team, um, but more broadly as a team, uh, go about our business. So if I can, in a way, assuming people have read the paper, take you to page four of the, of the presentation. Uh, this presentation is in a sense an exercise which has been distributed to all staff. It's a core part of their induction process. Um, we're, we're getting very good feedback in that it's beginning to help people understand, you know, really what it is they're here to achieve. But on on page four, if, if you're able to locate it, um, there's hopefully a relatively useful, helpful diagram, which just kind of, I hope, takes that single idea and expresses how it sort of becomes a set of tools, a set of behaviours which, which individual members of the team can start deploying in their own work. So you'll see that in this context, if the idea is high quality care for all, and in that context our job is to commission it, then what we're really doing is our purpose is to create the culture and conditions for service for staff on the front line to do their jobs properly. That's, and I think the purpose statement captures very richly, again, drawn from, from, from the observations of our own staff, what it is that we are here to do. Uh, and that then feeds into a series of values and behaviours, which it is just worth reflecting on. There are six of them. And I honestly think that people on our team, us ourselves, should be very much holding ourselves to account for delivering them. So we must prioritise patients in every decision we take. We must listen and learn. Uh, we must be evidence-based. Um, we must be open and transparent. <coughs> inclusive and constantly striving for improvement. Th th these seem obvious things, but to take the many things we could have uh, prioritised and deliver us with six, I think is a really helpful and important framework. I mean, it was interesting also listening to people as they started to express their own personal, you know, their own reasons for having joined this, this enterprise, having committed themselves uh, to this enterprise. Uh, some of the <coughs> things that people were coming up with as the core reasons for that was that they regarded NHS England as the guardian of the NHS. You know, this is a, they regard their role as, as frankly, a privilege, a, 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 not just important, vital, but, but as a privilege and, and something sort of sacrosanct. And I, I think that was, that was an important message that came across. Um, people are very committed to the idea that we, in everything we do, need to be compassionate. Jane has, of course, led on that in relation to nursing, but right across the piece, that's a value which people want this organisation to be. Uh, to be to be promoting and and equally the inequalities issue which is just raised that, that the idea that we should be an engine of social justice is fundamental to the reasons for many people joining the organization and again I hope it's captured uh, in some of the language that we're now proposing is the language that becomes as it were the the lexicon for how we express ourselves uh, moving forward um, just one other final point to make is that um, from those behaviors and the values so from the idea cascading downwards to the behaviours, therefore, that that implies for, 
for staff. We then also, of course, have the specific metrics against which staff will be will be uh, will be what well, the organisation as a whole will be measured, and that leads us into page 21 of the presentation, which reminds us of the 11 business plan metrics. Um, and for those on the live stream who haven't had a chance to read our business plan, I'd, I'd strongly recommend it. It's an unusually <coughs> brilliant document for a public service organisation to have produced. And one of the reasons for its brilliance is the fact that it is, it is offering us up against a series of very values-based, outcomes-based measures. You know, NHS England will only be successful if patients are satisfied with the services they're receiving uh, in, in their local communities. That is an amazingly brave and brilliant um, standard against which we should be judging ourselves. And that flows very directly from the from the core idea that this is about high quality care for all. So, ha obviously very happy to take some questions on that. Thank you, Tim, for that presentation. Victor. Uh, again, um, I think this is a really, uh, it is genuinely brave, and if we get this right, it will move the needle on the quality of services to the public generally. I, I, I believe that these things are generally not just about the aspiration but that are about the, the way in which we change the ongoing conversation. So mm -hmm. what you're creating is a test mm -hmm. within, the, organi within the, the organization that people will, we want them to uh, challenge, you know, in their day-to-day -day interactions with each other, with the public, etc. What I guess what I'm interested in and is what are your thoughts are on, on how we maintain the conditions for that test, you know, so that it doesn't become a a static piece of work that's out there that creates a huge um, expectation and energy and then in the white heat of delivery becomes less and less relevant yeah. when people are facing the day-to-day -day pressures and I, I, I think for me the test is what happens in you know when the plan hits pay dirt so I'm just some thoughts on how we how we do that uh, maybe there aren't any thoughts it's just a view I guess that, that it's about what happens in the in reality well, I mean, I think I've got two. My response, but I think it's almost for the board itself to reflect, is that the, if the board, the board, just the act of the board saying these things really matter. In fact, these <coughs> things are the most important things for us. Is is a would be a pretty is a pretty important uh, step step in the in the direction of ensuring that this is a dynamic living process. But the other thing, which I which is in the paper, and I didn't mention, is the incredibly good work that's been done by the team who works in uh, for, for me in patients information directorate on this, with with colleagues in in, in Joe's HR directorate on on making sure this is absolutely embedded in the induction process. So I think the board was updated on Launchpad at a recent meeting. But this is fundamental to that, and what we what we anticipate and want and it want to encourage is the idea that that people joining the organisation, people refreshing themselves with the values of the organisation will themselves be redesigning and refining this as we go forward. So I think we should expect to be coming back here in you know, six months, a year, with, with a, a description of how we have refined it, how we have changed it in light of, what, of, what, of what, how the organisation has developed and how peop what people are telling us as they, as they come into it. Thank you, Kieran. Um, I think this is hugely important. Um, I've been involved yeah, quite, sorry, quite yeah. a while, courtesy of, um, of Tim dragging me into it. Um, and I think the process by which we got to this was really impressive. I mean, the engagement from staff, the, the creativity, the thinking. But there, I, mean, I mean, I think there were two things going on. One was people were learning what NHS England was about, I think, and that, that's, that was all, everybody who was involved. But the second thing was it was trying to gain a consensus with people coming from all these different points of view about, you know, their experience of the NHS system was where they were coming from and having to been that was at least as important yeah. in the process. So, so working that through into induction business plan, I think was a, mm. it was a great job. So I think us getting behind this as a board and saying this is how we are going to hold ourselves and everybody in NHS England uh, to account um, is, is really, really important. Um, and the last one is I was trying very hard to say how I could change it, improve it, criticise it, etc. <laughs> Um, and the best I could do was try and sneak one word in on page 22, um, which is the one around uh, accountability. <coughs> if we were able to say we empower clinical, professional and patient yeah. leadership at all levels of the NHS, yeah. then I think it reinforces some of the stuff we're about. But, but that said, I, I think it was a great, great piece of work and everything we do and talk about, we should be referring back to this. You know, it's about you know, high quality care for all now and mm -hmm. in, in the future. Yeah. That's why we exist. Yeah. It's a good bit of work. Ros. 
Um, I just want to say I think this is really important as well for our relationships with CCGs. So I think as we've been building the new system, we've been really clear that our ability to deliver better outcomes is about, will depend on how we work with CCGs. So whilst we've been working with staff, we've been doing similar exercise with CCGs, and the feedback from CCGs is very congruent with this. So uh, a shared purpose around patients, listening and learning, and evidence-based. And I think in terms of holding ourselves to account, um, getting feedback through NHS clinical commissioners about how CCGs perceive us and the way that we behave will be a, a really good test of whether the values set out here, that we're living them in, in all our actions. And as you were saying, Victor, when, when it gets difficult, um, are we holding true to these behaviours? Yeah. Ed? Yeah. Again, I think one of the things that interests me is the extent to which we use storytelling of what is actually happening out there mm -hmm. uh, and bring that into play in terms of, of using those stories as an improvement mechanism. And I think there's a very strong link here to the Leadership Academy and the extent to which we, we use this at every level uh, of, of, of development in the Leadership Academy uh, alongside live storytelling of, 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 of what's actually happening. <coughs> Welcome. Could I just ask Mario. you whether CSUs were also involved, given that they are part of NHS England for the time being? <coughs> I'd have to check. Um, I, don't, I, I, I can't. I don't actually know the answer to that question. Okay. And could I just follow on, Malcolm, and ask about and care services are included um, throughout this? Yes. Um, and of course, we are not the commissioning body for. Um, social care services, so there's a, a complexity in, in that. There is, but I think the, the really important thing to capture, or we're all going to go slowly mad as we try and sort yes. of link our direct function to the job yes. we're trying to achieve, is, yes. is that this is about creating the culture and conditions for health and care services. So it's not necessary <coughs> that we are simply, we, we can only do that for services we directly commission. We can, in fact, set the tone mm -hmm. and work in partnership with, mm -hmm. with other commissioners to do that. So I think it's quite important. Well, that's what that purpose box mm -hmm. is trying to say. I mean, yes. can I think, I need a, sorry. Is this following on my father's point, really? Um, so to that extent, um, where um, we are in relationship with partners, we need to foster champions who will promote yeah, this exactly. story. Yeah. Um, and, and, and so we've got our own leadership programme, but the promotion of champions within other entities would actually help strengthen the message, yeah. and then I think that helps to deliver some of what... Uh, um, Vic Victor was, was asking how do, we, how do we move it forward on the ground? Yeah. Well, a couple of things about change management, really, in all, in all this. One, one of them for me is that very often this kind of work and this kind of paper is not completely well received in the NHS. It's kind of seen as something over here that we'll do when we've got time to do it, where the important job is to get on with. But I do think that. I certainly never believed that. Uh, I don't think it's right. And if, if anyone ever did, didn't believe it, you have to look at the Francis report and the importance of being really clear about the culture you're trying to create and then prosecuting that culture at every opportunity. And it genuinely saves lives. I mean, ge getting the right culture. And, and so that's, that's the first thing. The second thing I think is that very sometimes, in my experience of kind of supervisory or... Uh, commissioning bodies is that um, they spend quite a lot of time telling everybody else how they should value patients and get them at the centre and all the rest of it, but actually don't do it themselves because there's somehow they feel that that's their job just to tell everybody else to do it. And what we know is that you, in any change management thing, you start with yourself and you start with your own people and you start with your own organisation. And that's why this is so, so important to us. Um, and that's why the organisational development plan, which underpins this, is just as important. It's a mechanism for making that, that happen. I think the great news is that our people are really up for this. Yeah. Um, and, but people are sceptical about whether actually when the, we hit the road or whatever it, you describe it, whether it will get, get lost. So it's particularly important, I think, for the board to publicly recognise and support this and say it and then for us <coughs> to, to make sure that we, we kind of uh, prosecute it really carefully over the next period. Absolutely, and change starts here. 
um, I think, around the board table. Uh, but it isn't imposed, and what I find very attractive about this model is the extent that it's built up through a conversation with the 500. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I'm still just, you know, astonished that um, last month we had 70-odd staff, yeah. and this month we've got 7,000. <laughs> uh, and um, if I had joined the staff, I, I would be just completely bewildered, actually, of what this was, were it not for an exercise such as this that develops a common sense of purpose. It's not the chairman or even the chief executive defining what that is. Um, it's been a genuine exercise in engagement. I think that um, we need to continue to, to work very closely as members of the board uh, with staff uh, to try to ensure that what we achieve uh, with our own staff also through their behaviour has a knock-on impact in the relationships that they have with the rest of the system. So I'm very encouraged by what Ros says about CCGs, uh, for example, and the intimacy of our relationship with them uh, and um, the extent to which we are in a supportive and facilitative role, uh, I hope has a very considerable uh, knock-on effect. I think to signify the importance of the exercise and our commitment to it, we should put a definite date in the diary in six months' time uh, to come back, to measure it, to understand how it's working and to review it uh, and to see what further steps may be appropriate then. But may we bring it back to the board in six months? And, and I think then, Chairman, it would be a good idea to get some playback from staff of how much they've act actually absorbed it. So it's one thing to take people through this material. It's another thing to see how much of it they've retained. Mm. We can Very maybe good. pick some of that up through the staff barometer. I'll yes. pick that up mm. as an action. Yeah. Okay, thank but you. There's also a challenge to us, but whether we've lived it as well, um, and that has to start, as David says, with mm. our behaviour. Right. Um, <coughs> subject to the Kieran Devane Amendment on page 22, <laughs> may I invite you to um, approve and enthusiastically endorse the paper? Yes, very much. Thank you very much. Right.